Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we're going to discuss game mastering. I've been running tabletop games now for a few decades and across a wide variety of systems, and I've made just about every single mistake that a game master can make. Some of those I learned my lessons quickly, while others required me screwing up a couple times before that lesson managed to sink in. Many mistakes were made. So what we're going to do is go over some of the tips that I wish that I'd known back when I first started running games, so hopefully some of the newer game masters out there don't have to go through those same difficult lessons that I had to. Now, any experienced game masters, hopefully you should know all this stuff, but it's also good to get a reminder from time to time. Now, this video is system neutral, so whether you're going to be playing D&D, Call of Cthulhu, Traveler, or whatever else, the same advice is going to apply. Now, my first tip is more of a disclaimer, really, and that's that every piece of Game Master advice is bad if taken to extremes. Every video or forum where someone is laying out a couple Game Master tips, there's always that one person who shows up and is all, This is wrong. I took this advice to a ridiculous extreme and bad things happen. It's like saying how you should drink plenty of water, then some guy downs 10 gallons in a day, gets water intoxication, and then claims that this advice is totally wrong because they're an idiot. So use your best judgment here. There are always going to be exceptions and extremes, and this goes for all of my advice or any Game Master advice that you encounter. So, disclaimers out of the way, let's get this started. Find your own voice. Many new Game Masters start out trying to emulate their own Game Master. Maybe they've watched one on a streaming show, and yeah, I certainly did that where I was trying to copy what my Game Master did. When approaching a situation, they think, how would my favorite Game Master do this? And that's exactly what they do. Unfortunately, you're not that Game Master. They have strengths that you don't have. But more importantly than that, you're ignoring what your own strengths are. And the faster a new Game Master discovers their own style, which draws from their own abilities, the better your game are going to go and the more, more fun you and your players are going to have. Now, this isn't to say that game masters shouldn't learn from other game masters. There are a lot of great tricks and methods to learn and steal, so go ahead, try to find out what it is other GMs do and see what you can learn from that. For example, the past few years I've been playing Call of Cthulhu with the How We Roll podcast under Scott Dorward. And Scott has a really effective trick to wrangling us all in from joking around as he's introducing the horror, where he slowly starts lowering his voice, drawing us in, making us listen as he describes the monster scene, and then at the very end, almost as if an afterthought, he then asks us for any sanity saves and whatever our character is going to do. It's such an effective but simple trick, but one that I immediately adapted in my own games after experiencing how well that worked. So instead of imitating, simply incorporate those tricks and methods into your own game master style, but definitely, and you should always have your own voice be shining through that. Now let's talk about rules. Game masters need to know a lot of rules, but learning them all is probably impossible. But what's more important is you need to be confident enough in your understanding that you can make a fair judgment call and keep the game going, rather than stopping the game to look up some minor detail, because stopping the game halts the momentum, sucking the fun right out of the game. No one enjoys it when this happens. Sometimes we have to check something out in the book, but more often than not, it's better just to make a rules call and keep the game going. You know, once the session is done, you can then go back and look it up and see if you did it right, and if you didn't do it right and the rules said something different than what you called, that's no problem at all. Just let your players know that, and you kind of announce how this rule is going to be treated going forward, even though we did it this one time before. Because communication and consistency is essential. Mistakes are going to get made. That happens. But what players hate more than anything is inconsistent rulings, where the same situation, the rules work in one way in one session and another way in another session, and there's no announcement between them, so the players have no idea what the rules are going to be at any given moment. So if you make a bad call in one game, own it. Be up front. Say you made a mistake, announce to your players how that rule is going to be treated going forward, and then stick to it after that. The vast majority in tabletop groups can really just be solved through open communication. Now before the game, you're going to need to prepare. Now there's an eternal debate about how much you need to prepare, but I feel that a game master's job is to have the adventure prepared before the session begins, but how much that preparation needs to be really depends on the system itself and what sort of adventure we're going to be having. Now generally speaking, I feel that it's better to be 
be more prepared than you need to be than it is to be unprepared. After all, if you prepare something that you don't use, you can save that and use that again in a future session, no worries at all. However, in going with that earlier note about extremes, there is a point where over-preparation can be worse than being underprepared. If you've got detailed notes of every single book that appears in a library and every NPC in a city, and then you've got notebooks and notebooks brimming with stuff, then you're going to have to be stopping the game and wasting everybody's time to search through all that stuff to find out whatever it was that you prepared, which that can be a lot worse than that underprepared game master who's now stalling the game, trying to come up with something that they should have done beforehand. Then there's also just the return on investment. If you're preparing pages and pages of stuff, but never using that, that can be pretty disheartening as a game master because you wasted a bunch of time preparing lots of things. You also didn't focus that much energy on those things that you ended up actually using. And then you're going to find out if there's a trend between those things of what you're preparing and not using and what you're preparing and you are using, then you could probably figure out what it is you don't need to be wasting your time on and all your prep time on in future games, uh, because it takes a little bit of experience with that just to kind of see what all ends up getting used or getting used the most often. And now you can focus your energy into preparing what you should rather than what you don't need to be worrying about. But most importantly, no matter how much you prepare, in the end you're going to have to be improvising. Between your players and whatever it is they do and the chaos factor of dice, there is going to be something that you did not prepare for, and don't stress about that. And the reason that I encourage a lot of prep before each session isn't so I can coast through the game without having to use strain my brain that much, but it's because I now have ready-made portions good to go, and I can instead spend all of my brain power caulking the gaps and improvising those unpredicted variables, rather than spending all of my mental energy trying to come up with everything on the fly. And that's because players will never do what you expect. No matter how well you think that you know them or how many contingencies you've planned, your players are going to surprise you. And when they do, let them. Those surprises are fun, as you're now racing to keep up with them and trying to improvise and trying to keep everything just good to go and everybody having fun. So don't railroad them into your planned story. That's just disappointing for both you and your players, so don't plan their actions for them. So instead of creating the player's solutions, what you're going to be job is is to create situations for those players to solve. For example, let's say your game master says, you awaken in a dark dungeon cell. Now you know why the characters are there, who put them there, what's being hidden from them, and what they might discover if they search around. You know everything around this location and the situation, but you don't know what the players are going to do about this. It's not that they awaken and they have to solve this one specific course of action to get out. Half the time I have no idea how it is my players are going to be solving whatever mystery or obstacle it is that I give them. You know, I might throw in a few potentials. You know, there might be a loose stone here. If they remove it, they can spend a little bit of time widening out that hole and they can escape. Or the patrolling guard passes every hour and the keys are visible hanging off of his belt, so a good pickpocket roll might snag them off the belt. Or the door hinges might be poorly made and overcome, you know, some easy way with a little bit of leverage. But the players might just come up with something completely crazy that I hadn't been anticipating, like the old, you know, uh, I'm sick gag. And even when the guard comes into the cell to investigate, they smash him over the head with that rock that they pulled out of the wall, you know, totally ignoring the fact they could have just kept widening that hole out. Then they put on the guard's clothes and they spend the next six hours patrolling the grounds until the shift finally changes. And then that player character, you know, they clock out as the guard, they go, you know, leave the bad guy's lair right through the front door, they go home to their new life with their new family. That's not anything I could have anticipated, but at the same time, nothing would really surprise me at this point. Next, while the Game Master should be tailoring the game for the players and what it is those players enjoy or what those players want, there can be too much of a good thing. Just because your players want something doesn't mean that they should get it easily or even get it at all. This is one where you really have to consider the effects of your actions. A player probably does not want their character to die or suffer any sort of loss. I mean, of course not, why would they? But if they you know, lose that risk of possibly dying or losing anything, then the game is going to lose its appeal because the player's enjoyment, you know, their accomplishments, that's going to start diminishing because they really didn't actually accomplish anything if you're trying to pad it too much where they can't die or they can't lose anything. So while they don't want it, they do still want the risk of that happening. So yeah, they might want that super powerful Vorpal Sword at first level or all maxed out stats, you know, 18s all the way. But if they do, now the game balance is completely out the window. So they might want lots of treasure, but now they're constantly swimming in cash and now money is meaningless and no longer serves as any form of motivation for them. Or if they say, yeah, yeah we want lots of combat, so now we've got overlong and tedious combats and everyone's getting bored because all of a sudden the game has become nothing but combats, 
even though that's what they asked for. I talked about my experience with this in my Game Master Sins videos, where I showered my players with too much loot, or made resurrections too easy, like you die, meet your god, your god sends you back like 10 minutes later, possibly with a shiny new sword so that doesn't happen again, and now death is no more than a minor inconvenience and possibly a loot drop. And when I did that video, a lot of commenters thought that I was talking about resurrections you know, being a bad thing, which I wasn't. I was talking about just totally freely handing out divine resurrections, like once or twice a session with zero effort given by the players at all, I was taking that one to one of those unhealthy extremes that I talked about. Think of it like a really good will they or won't they plot in a TV show. You know, we get sucked into this story hoping that our two heroes get together and, you know, that keeps us coming back. But then at some point in season three or four, the studio caves to the audience's demands and our heroes get together. And all of a sudden, our interest in that show just suddenly drops through the floor because the reason that we were watching it has gone away. And now the show it isn't much fun because we actually got what it was we wanted. But the thing that we really wanted was that anticipation. You know, that was the actual draw that kept us coming back week after week. So Game Masters, it's up to you to decide how the players get whatever it is they want. You might give it to them freely just you know right away, or you might make them have to wait and have to fight to earn it, or you might decide that it's best not to give it to them at all because that's going to actually end up spoiling the game. And that's a balance that you have to do. You don't want to refuse too much and now all of a sudden you become a stingy Game Master. It's not giving the players anything that they want. But just as importantly at that, you don't want to accidentally ruin their enjoyment in the game by giving giving them too much because you confuse the player wanting something with the player wanting to want something or spoiling the game by giving them too many traps or too many combats or whatever it was that they showed interest in. It's like that old adage about careful what you wish for, you might just get it. Well, in these sort of cases, it's like you're the genie that's granting the wish and you have to decide for yourself, is this something that the player actually wants or is this something that the player's going to regret if they actually get what they think they want? Now, one thing that players enjoy is rolling dice. A common Game Master tip that I've encountered is players love rolling dice, so give them plenty of opportunity to do so. You know, not only is it fun to give yourself up to random chance, you know, try to see if fate you know, decides how you're going to go, but that advice is also about players who want to roll dice. It's more about them being involved in the game rather than uh, being involved in overlong planning sessions or listening to their Game Master monologue logging for hours, but meaningless dice rolls suck. First, asking for too many rolls only increases the overall chance of failure. An example for this is, let's say, climb checks. I remember having to give climb checks in the old edition every 10 feet. But the problem is if the character wants to climb, let's say, 100 feet, now they're making 10 climb checks. And while each of those checks might have a 90% chance of success, if you require one roll after another after another, the overall chance of them succeeding that task of climbing a 100-foot cliff becomes shockingly less than 90%. Same thing goes for perception checks. If you require a perception roll for every single item in a room, or for things that are clearly obvious that you shouldn't even have to roll for, it not only becomes tedious for the player, but it starts decreasing their chances of finding everything, rather than if you just simply called for a single check. And simply handing them the clearly obvious things, and you know, just shouldn't that shouldn't even require a roll at all. If there's a giant tower in front of them, just tell them there's a giant tower in front of them. Or something like sense motive, where a player is trying to determine if an NPC is lying to them or not. So instead of asking for a separate check after each and every question that the player character asks, just determine any modifiers and have the player roll a single time for the entire conversation. That just saves a ton of time and frustration and makes the game flow much, much smoother. Recently, or at least like a year ago recently, I brought in a new player who was used to his other games you know, having to make dozens of rolls to do one specific task or having to specify each and everything they do in order to search a room. Like, you know, they say they're checking the underside of the drawers, specifying that they're looking under the bed or under the rug and between the mattresses and all of that stuff, which really does sound cool until you've done that a hundred times. And now it's this kind of tedious slog where the players are just kind of reciting all the places that they're going to check without even thinking about. They're just kind of going through this mantra of like, I check the bottoms of the drawers, I check all the chests, I check to make sure there's no false bottoms in the chest, yada, 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 yada. That gets really tiring and boring really, really fast. So he brought it into the game and we were playing some Call of Cthulhu. The player said that he wanted to search a room trying to find some clues, so I made him roll a spot hidden check and that was it. So he succeeded, found what it was that was hidden in the room, but he tried to keep pushing this because he wasn't used to this idea. He's like, I'm going to look under the couch and the back is of all the picture frames. And I told him that, uh, dude, you already did all that. 
that stuff. That's what that single roll meant, which is why I told him the thing that he found was hidden inside the couch, even though the player had never specified that he was checking inside the couch, because when he said he was searching the room, it was assumed that he was going to do all that, and his role was determining how effective he was at doing that. And that player was so shocked by just how easy it was. Just one single roll, they found their clue, and now we could fo focus all of our attention on what it was the characters were going to do with those clues, rather than wasting a bunch of time and a bunch of roles searching a room, which really, really does get tiring after a while. So yeah, while the old Game Master of Ice, a players love rolling dice, that is certainly true. The trick is having those dice rolls mean more, quality over quantity here. Next, only have the player roll the dice if you are willing to accept both success and failure. Now this is a common mistake that I've made a million freaking times. The player asks for something completely unreasonable, like walking into a room and seducing the slime monster, or picking up a rock and hurling it three miles. The Game Master, unwilling to simply tell them that no, that is not possible here. They bet on the odds and tell the player to roll the dice instead, but then the player scores a 20 or a critical success or whatever it is, and now the game master either has to go with something ridiculous that should be impossible, or they then have to tell the player no, that he can't do that, which is only going to piss off the player because you as the game master told them that they could roll, even though that you knew there was zero chance of success, now they're mad that you made them roll anyway. Or, and this is actually the part where I'm most guilty of it, the player wants to do some task, and the game master, you know, they're wanting to have that dramatic tension of you know, having him roll the dice, you know, the, they're kind of upset, like, oh no, maybe I won't succeed, so the game master's like, roll the dice, but the game master's really wanting him to make this roll, the game master might actually need for them to make that roll, and all of a sudden, despite the odds, the player character fails the roll, or worse yet, they fumble. So what should have been a simple task that could have kept the game going, you know, now it's kind of pulled everything to a spot, you know, stop, and now the game master, you know, they're trying to keep the game together and they're kicking themselves because they knew better than to ask for a roll, but they asked for a roll anyway to make it more dramatic, and now they've screwed everything up, and they really shouldn't have asked for that roll in the first place. If your game hinges on a single success or a single failure that needs to happen at some specific time, and you are not willing to play out what happens if the characters end up succeeding when you wanted them to fail, or failing on that one that you needed them to succeed, then don't ask for a roll at all. Don't even let that one go up to chance. If a player wants something that's unreasonable, don't imply to them that they have a chance by giving them permission to roll for it. Don't even give them permission to roll. Now, game masters will ask for a bunch of needless or impossible rolls for a lot of different reasons. You know, there's the one I mentioned before, the drama, the player tension as they roll the dice. You know, even though they've got a 99% chance of success, there's that ooh, and they roll the dice, and that's why the game master wants them to roll even though they need that player to succeed. Or very often it's a stalling tactic. The player asks for something and the game master isn't quite sure, they need a moment to think about it, so they kind of blurt out, hey, roll the dice, without really considering what that might mean if they succeed or fail, until after the player has already succeeded or failed and now the game master is looking at it going, uh-oh, I'm not committed to this. Now another option, this one is usually better, and this is for those cases where you need the character to succeed at something, like finding that critical clue, is to redefine what the role means. Such as, the players are searching a room, or trying to find that patron to give them the job, don't think of that role's failure as failure to accomplish the task, but simply success at a cost or with some sort of complication. So maybe failing that search role means that they did find the thing that they needed, but also in the process they broke something valuable and now they gotta get chased out of there. Or maybe the bad guy happens along and discovers them in the act and now all of a sudden we've got a conflict or an escape that we've got to do. Essentially the role means that you, it's not success or failure, but simply the ease of success that we're going to have. Same thing when you've got that player that's asking for that clearly impossible task that they would have rolled for, you know, if the character walks into the throne room and tries to persuade Shaq to convince the king just to hand over the title to them, simply redefine that role as being as how bad this is about to go for them. Okay, well if you fail the role, he's going to be insulted and have you locked in the dungeon. But if you make the role, he's going to think that you're just joking with him and he's going to laugh at your joke. That is all around much better than simply stating, no, you can't even try to roll for that, because now you're saying, hey, you're not going to succeed, but if you want to try for it, go for it. Be my guest. Next, let's talk about world building. Creating your game world with histories and cool features and populating it with various characters, that is a lot of fun to do. However, never forget that RPGs are about the player characters and what those characters do and to that world. This is classic writing advice, a mantra of every single editor out there, story is the characters, not the setting. 
players came to play the game, not sit around and listen to you talk about your brilliant world and all the intricate plots that their characters aren't involved with, like they're just listening to a novel reading. Those features can be awesome, and they can add a lot of depth to the game, but they should never ever take the spotlight away from the player characters. Your players are rarely ever going to care as much about your game world as you do. Next, let's talk about role-playing. Many players, especially newer players, might be a bit intimidated or embarrassed by doing character voices or simply really getting into their character's personality or different quirks like that. And you cannot force your players to do role-play if they don't want to do role-play. That rarely ends in anything but frustration for you and frustration for the player and often frustration for everybody else around the table. But the best way for a game master to get their players to role-play and enjoy role-playing is by setting an example. If you role-play out all the colorful NPCs, you know, talking to their characters rather than to the players, it makes it fun and encourages a role-played interaction between you. And it takes the pressure off of them by feeling that they're going to embarrass themselves, you know, by getting into character or something like that if you are doing it first and you are hamming it up and obviously having a lot of fun. And then once one player around the table, you know, they get involved in that and they start role-playing back and forth with you and they start having fun, it only accelerates it among the rest of the players because, you know, peer pressure, that is a powerful thing. And now the players are more inclined to want to role-play rather than feel like they have to because you as the game master are forcing them to do it and they're not quite comfortable with that. Now, sometimes they still don't want to role play, and that is also perfectly fine. Not every player out there actually enjoys role playing as much as they enjoy playing all the other aspects of the game. And one of the more difficult lessons that I've had to learn is just to accept that players might want something different out of the game than you do. You know, maybe you want lots of social interactions while they just want combat, or you might want big epic heroes that go out and save the nation or save the world while they want to play morally ambiguous soldiers of fortune. You might want a serious game while they want to have a much more kind a funny slapstick game. The natural inclination for us is that uh, we're going to assume that they're doing it wrong, or maybe not understanding how awesome your way of doing it's going to be. Yours is the superior way to have fun. And you know what? Maybe you can convince them. Talk it out, and they'll give it a try, and they'll find out that, oh my god, it's right. But if not, it's not because either of you are wrong in how you want to have fun, but simply that you have different tastes or different priorities. And if that's the case, ask yourself, is that a problem? If not, figure out whatever your compromise is and have fun. But if that is a problem and you can't work out a compromise between you, it might be best that you two not play together because neither of you are going to enjoy it that much. And if that does sound harsh, that maybe you shouldn't play with this person, that is a lesson that I really, really wish I had known many years ago because it would have saved me and saved my group a whole lot of trouble. Once again, open and honest communication is essential. I can never, ever stress that one enough. And finally, and this is a really huge one, don't be afraid to suck. Countless game masters or hopeful game masters get into their head that everything has to be perfect before they can run a game. And truth is, you are going to make mistakes. I make them all the time. I make them way more than people might assume. But don't let your fear of making mistakes hold you back from running a new game or trying different things out. Game mastering is an ongoing process, and refusing to grow or attempt new themes or plots or systems or styles because you're worried that you might suck if you try one of those, all that's doing is holding you back. Very often, this behavior can be recognized in that game master who just keeps putting off that campaign they're talking about because they're over-preparing it. You're always saying that there's one more thing I gotta do, one more thing I gotta prepare, when really that's just a procrastination method saying that they need to finish one more thing and then one more thing before they pull the trigger and starting in it. Because the truth is, they're probably actually just afraid of sucking and having a bad game, and that's the reason that we're not even gonna have a game at all, which... Ultimately, that's a whole lot worse. So go out and make your mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and have fun. Because you're never, ever going to improve until you just go for it. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, amigos, stay awesome. You know, I feel like you really didn't use us that much in this video. Yeah, I figured I'd rather use you guys when you can help a video out rather than just use you in every video because I'm supposed to.